Go. And it's recording too, so we'll get it. Okay, great. We're live, live. We're live, live. Hi, everyone. Welcome in. We'll get started shortly. Okay, there's like 91 people in here. So I'm just gonna say, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And, um, you know, it's like extra points for all of you that are here early. So, uh, and on time. So welcome, give yourselves a pat on the back or a pat somewhere, smile, a positive message in your head. Um, and we are going to jump in. So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for another important conversation on our new CECUS online programming. Uh, I'm so glad to have everybody here. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be here with some amazing panelists who you will get to know and love here very shortly. Um, we have all kinds of people here. It looks like 97 right now. So the number just keeps climbing, not to make anybody nervous here. We're gonna do it, we got this. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and jump in. Uh, first, I'll introduce myself. My name is Andrew Aliman. My pronouns are he, him. And I am the vice chair for the CECUS Board of Directors. Um, and I also am bringing in my experiences uh, working at Black and Pink, uh, my experiences as a clinical social worker, um, and as a queer person of color myself. So. Uh, a little bit about CECUS before I tell you about our brilliant panelists. Uh, CECUS was founded in 1964 to be the leading voice for shame-free education on human sexuality and a champion, a champion for a sexual and reproductive freedom as an essential part of the human experience. CECUS asserts that sex education is a powerful vehicle for social change. We are the only national organization solely focused on advocating for the rights of all people to accurate information, comprehensive sexual, sexuality education, and the full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health services. At CECUS, we believe that, the sex, ed, that sex ed can spark social change at the nexus of many social justice movements for racial justice, LGBTQ rights, to the Me Too movement, and urgent conversations around consent and healthy relationships. So uh, that's who we are. Thank you very much for joining CECUS Online, a series of virtual armchair discussions uh, sponsored by B5. 
the explore that explore how sex education can be a vehicle for uh, social change with leading experts in the field. B Vibe's core mission is to empower exploration through education by offering a constant array of accessible content, carefully written guides, and a real world information. The brand promotes inclusivity and informed play. Seek Us Online seeks to explore the latest sex ed topics with the folks who know the most about them. All proceeds uh, for Seek Us Online events support invited speakers and Seek Us's work for advancing progressive sex ed policy across the United States. Uh, tonight's event, which you are all here for today, uh, is mental health, sex positivity, and young people or youth where we will explore the factors impacting youth mental health, sexual activity, and how sexual positivity and comprehensive sex education can play a role in improving mental health for young people. But before we begin, let's go over a couple housekeeping items. You know, we all love our, our Zoom housekeeping rules. Um, as you know, we are here on the Zoom webinar platform, which means that you all are muted and your videos are off, ours are not. However, um, feel free to chat in the function. I'm going to say I uh, would love it if you all could um, make some noise and stuff in the chat, then we know that you're here, we know that you're enjoying it. If somebody says something that you really enjoy, give them a little shout out, um, retweet it, requote it, all of those sort of things. So please be involved in the chat. Also, there's the Q&A box that you should see, and we invite you to use that to submit your questions. Um, the lovely Gabby Doyle, CECUS's partner, uh, CECUS's state partnership manager, will be monitoring the audience questions and Q&A, making sure that we stay online, making sure that I'm doing my job, all of those sort of things. So uh, thank you to Gabby for keeping us on track. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. If we can't get to them, we'll do our best to collect some unanswered questions and uh, do a brief response or follow up. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available for everyone who registered for the event. We also plan to post the recording on CECUS's website at www.secus.org. The recording should be made available um, to the public early next week. As many nonprofit organizations, uh, the coronavirus pandemic and economic uncertainty has impacted CECUS and support for our work. This event is intended to be a fundraiser for CECUS, so we invite you to visit uh, CECUS.org uh, backslash donate um, to make a contribution so that CECUS can continue working with federal, state, and local governments and schools to advance comprehensive sex education programs and policies. So, um, Let's go ahead and uh, learn who is here tonight, um, the amazing panelists for you all. Um, you don't have to hear my voice all night, although I'm sure that you're loving it and enjoying it. Um, so let's jump straight in. <laughs> um, first up, uh, we have uh, Melanie Willingham Jaggers, who uh, uses they and she pronouns and is the interim executive director at GLSEN. If you're not familiar with GLSEN, GLSEN is a national nonprofit that works to ensure K through 12 education is safe and affirming for all students. And that means including the LGBTQ plus youth that we are talking about um, as well um, in this conversation today. Um, her vision for the next chapter of GLSEN's work is rooted in the belief that education can and should be an experience that is safe, affirming, and liberating. And that can be achieved only when we build in racial, gender, and disability justice in our education system as a key indicator of success. I don't know about you, but I feel like that deserves some snaps right there. Um, Melanie is bringing in all sorts of different experience um, from uh, various places, including the Worker Institute at uh, Cornell University's School of Industrial and Labor Relations. Um, as well as um, serving as the former chair, uh, board chair of the Audrey Lord Project. Um, so we are really excited for Melanie to bring in uh, 
her views um, and her extensive work uh, in social justice movements and organizations. So thank you very much. Snaps to Melanie. Uh, moving on, we have Jacqueline Dean. Also, I'm not doing any of these people justice. They're way more amazing than I even have time to say today. But uh, next, Jacqueline Dean, um, she, her pronouns, policy and government affairs director at the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. Uh, Jacqueline was uh, born and raised in Plano, Texas, uh, and is a proud daughter of Taiwanese immigrants. She started her career working on a state representative campaign in Houston through Annie's List, which helps elect progressive pro-choice women into office um, in Texas. She also served as Peace Corps volunteer in Morocco, um, working on programs, uh, after school programs with adolescent youth. And then she joined um, NAPOF in 2017, where she leads the organization's government relations and legis legislative affairs on policy issues and reproductive health uh, and rights, immigrant rights, and ac economic justice. So uh, please welcome um, Jacqueline to this space as well. Snaps. And then, last but certainly not least, um, Sam Britton um, from uh, Trevor Project, who is the Vice President of Advocacy, ooh, hitting my phone, computer, Vice President of Advocacy and Government Affairs, as I mentioned, at Trevor Project. Uh, Sam uses they, them pronouns. I can't remember if I said, but Jacqueline uses she, her pronouns. And if you're not familiar with Trevor Project, uh, Trevor Project is the leading national organization providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention services to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning youth. Um, so excited to have uh, Sam's perspective on um, how mental health impacts um, young people right now. So thank you very much, uh, bringing all these policy and program experiences um, and I'm ready to jump right in. I don't know about y'all. We have 111 people here with us. They're saying things in the chat. So I think we're all ready. So let's jump in. Um, something that's always important to me is like centering our why, figuring out why we're here, why we're doing the work. Um, so my first question for all of you is what's your why? Why did you even agree to join this discussion today about youth mental health? Whoever wants to start. I feel like Sam's going for it. I was, no, I was uh, reading text. I was going to give that space to others. If Jack, I am happy to do it. I am an annoying ball of energy. So if you want to go after me, totally fine. But uh, Jack, do you want to do it first? Sure, I can, I can okay. go first. Um, so I, um, you know, I'm here today and I, I said yes to, to speaking today because I'm very passionate uh, about bringing visibility to API communities. And I think that API young people have very unique experiences when it comes to mental health and um, sexuality and um, sexual identity. And so I think it's really important to bring that to this space, um, especially as um, APIs have gotten a lot of attention in the last in the last week. I think you know we've been talking a lot about uh, racial misogyny that's been taking place and violence and um, a lot of that. Um, you know the the really I think the um, a, a lot of the root causes of that can be from a lack of education and supportive environments um, in our ed education systems that we get as young people. Absolutely, thank you. It's really powerful. Thank you for uh, and thank you for getting us started. Um, I my why uh, is kind of um, being I I do this because I I like to think of it as like the greatest um, physics problem known to mankind. We're trying to change the future, right? Like like I I understand. Um, my background is I, I'm a nuclear engineer by training, right? I used to disarm nuclear bombs and that's really stressful, but there is nothing as stressful as recognizing what is coming for the young people of the current generation. This, this idea of, of how do I make sure 
that I am living my life in a way that that is supportive, right? That is that is it is creating um, a better world than when I got it, but also in one that is a little bit less stressful, right? Like I, my why of mental health is because mine isn't always great. We before everyone joined, I I, I started with the point of like. I'm surviving with a smile. That is my mental health right now. It is it is not thriving. I will get there. I have been there. I shall return. But right now it's survival. And that that reality of um at least I have the ability to survive and that not all not all LGBTQ young people and a lot of all people out there, right, um are having that means that um we have work left to do, right? Like that we have a lot of effort to make sure that a lot more folks don't have to just be surviving and that they can survive in the first place. Yes, thank you for uh, the reminder that it's okay to not be okay sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll jump in. Um, so my why is because I got my eyes set on freedom um, for all of us. Um, and my understanding of myself is porous and it's connected, right? So. When I do this work, uh, when I show up in these ways, it's not because like I'm not showing up for some theoretical outside community. Um, I'm showing up um, because it's personal, uh, because because we are all we are all my people. Um, and I would end with this and just say that you know, cis sexism, uh, white supremacy, patriarchy, colonialism is trying to take us all out. Um, and I come from people who have always said hell no to that. Um, and that work continues. Um, and so my why, the why that I showed up today, the why I show up to work every day um, is because we've got work to do. Um, and because we are not, none of us are free until all of us are free. Um, and I take that super personally, right? This is, this is about my freedom. And I know that I'm not free until we all are. So that's why, that's why I'm here. Yes. Um, my heart just broke because I realized that uh, Zoom webinar does not have like hearts and thumbs up and stuff. And I just went to give you a heart and it's like, <laughs> dude, my heart was destroyed. Um, <laughs> but huge heart, thank you. Um, so I know that I'm a panelist, but I'm going to answer um, this question um, in the sense of what's so important for me is that young people are watching us every day. And so we're constantly modeling for young people. And so if we send the message that it's that we have to be on, we have to be perfect all the time, um, then that's something that they think that they always have to live up to. So I'm going to add that to the amazing things that you all said as well, um, which is my why, why I showed up today and said, all right, I'll moderate this. <laughs> um, question two, Let's jump in. Um, so we know from several studies and youth surveys, including GLSEN supporting safe and healthy schools for LGBTQ youth and National Climate Survey, as well as Trevor Project's research brief on Black LGBTQ youth mental health and National Survey on LGBTQ youth mental health, that under-resourced young people tend to experience more impactful and long-lasting mental health outcomes. So with that being said, my question for all of you is what does thriving look like for under-resourced young people, thinking about BIPOC, LGBTQIA2S+, um, young people living with disabilities, um, young people navigating the pandemic, all of that. What does thriving look like? So... I love that I just said, right? I am surviving, but I'm seeking thriving for others. Um, so I'll answer the question with um, uh, the hope I have, right? Um, not, not necessarily the reality of today, um, but where we are aiming. So we start, I love that you brought in the data, right? We, we know there is a problem, but we also know the solutions. I think that has been one of the really important parts of why we have to ask questions. Um, as it relates to mental health, as it relates to um, identity, we need to be bringing um, representation, not just as a personal story, right? Like, no, it's not just what's worked for what what's going to work in Sam's life. It's what's going to work across the board because we know that it's worked for others, right? Like that is that's let's center let's center our solutions there, right? So first off. <laughs> Adverse mental health impacts and ad adverse physical health outcomes are cyclical, right? We, we, 
we don't, we, we may like have that moment where like, oh my gosh, Sam's having a thriving day. Awesome. But if tomorrow I'm yet again having my, my rights voted on, ah, that's going to move out of thriving real fast there. Right. So um, I, I think that there's a really clear, there's a really clear point of we have to, we have to try to break that cycle with enough good policy, with enough resilience, with enough, um, you know, actions that we don't keep falling into the, the I'm okay today, but tomorrow um, could be, could be, you know, my last. If you're a young person and you have low self-worth, right? You're going to choose, you may choose to engage in sexual risk behaviors, such as not using a condom, like you could then in that cycle that could lead to contracting an STI, you may then face societal stigma because of that STI, right? And then, then that's leading back again to your lower self-worth. So you see the cycle there. The cycle there means that if we had education, if we had um, a culture that didn't stigmatize um, these types of actions, if we, if we were able to help that young person in the classroom and say, you are more than worthy. Um, this is not a. This is not a space. We're going to be able to break that cycle and actually, you know, start to save some more lives. So your thriving cycle is going to be that opposite, right? You you are inclusively educated. You feel empowered and not stigmatized. You when you walk into the classroom are like, I get to learn and be myself, not hide and pray that some of this sticks in my head while I'm going through this, um, this moment of doubt, right? Like it is, I told you I was a nuclear physicist, right? It is easier for me to study when I have my, you know, uh, my Kesha, my, my playing in the background. Why? Because I'm hearing a proud independent woman say, this is my experience. Like, join me or get lost. And that's going to help me remember my quantum physics better than listening to potentially a sermon of someone who says that I shouldn't exist. That is really hard um, to kind of do that. So if we're thinking of thriving, right, we just literally think of anything that will, that will punctuate a cycle and keep it on, on an upward path, right? Instead of just trying to solve all the problems, our thriving needs to be about breaking cycles, about saying there are other cycles that could make you have a better existence that don't rely on, on um, depreciation of self-worth, that don't rely on stigma. So the physical and mental health that we are trying to enable and empower is about independence. It's about, again, what is that breaking of the cycle? It's about reminding the person that they're in the driver's seat. You're no longer having to drive around that circle again. You get to take the off ramp. You get to um, go and you know to that to that lovely um, beach vacation. That's your that's your choice. Not having to go back um, into the grind. So maybe that was way too many metaphors, and hopefully some of that made sense. <laughs> um, but uh, the short answer is: thriving is about breaking bad cycles and driving new paths. And those yes. new paths need to be given the resources. And come on, like self-determination, self-choice, uh, validating identities in the classroom, all of that. Thank you. Uh, Melanie, did you, I know that you wanted to talk on this one too. Yeah, sure thing. So um, I'm going to answer your question about thriving, but first I'm going to ask us a question, uh, which mm. is what do we owe our children, right? What do we mm. owe our children? We owe our children systems that serve them, especially the ones that we require them to be in, right? Um, and that the systems serve them um, and that they see them and that they help make them more whole, right? That's what our systems um, owe. That's what we owe our children. That's what our systems ought to provide. Now, Sam just talked a lot about what doesn't happen in those systems. And I've got the, I've got the research. We've got the, we've got the receipt. Glisten has the receipts. Um, so I can talk about those in more detail also, but he here's what I would just say at the top, which is that um, education can and should be liberating, right? We should be, we are sending people in at, you know, three years old to pre-K, five years old to kindergarten. They're coming out at 18, 16, 17, 18, 19 years old. And it is the, it should be the outcome of this system that they are more whole, that they understand themselves, their community, their world, the society, our democracy more. Right. And so when we're talking about sexual health, it, it's part of sexual education 
this is part of education, right? This is about who is my body? What is, what is my body doing? <laughs> who, what is this person's body? What is that person's body doing? How might my body and their body be in conversation with one another? Like there is, this education is about understanding the world around you and we have a responsibility to educate. And I think we have to take seriously um, what miseducation is and both the disservice that it does but the rights that it tramples on, right? When you are able, when, when a system tells a child, a whole and perfect child, that they are wrong and not whole and imperfect, right? Then that system is incorrect. That system is wrong. And when we require our children to go through those systems, something is deeply broken, right? So what does thriving look like? Thriving looks like um, young people being told the truth about themselves, about their communities, about their world, Right and and getting um, getting inf reliable information from adults in their lives um, about how to navigate that world, how to make the best decisions they can. That is what leads to thriving. So I'll stop there. Yes, I don't know about y'all, but I don't, I don't think I was ready for this tonight. <laughs> but listen, I prepped with y'all, and I still wasn't ready for this. So I hope the 115 people sitting here watching this, y'all doing all right. I hope y'all doing all right. Um, take what you need, take what you need. Uh, this will be recorded. You don't have to take it all in, just take pieces in, take the rest in later. Um, well, let's go to the next question. And Jacqueline, I would love if you uh, could start with this one. But um, so, I, you know, it's perfect segue. You know, Melanie was um, kind of talking about uh, uh, the awareness around us. Um, and so I'm I'm really excited to think about like self-awareness and the impact that um, self-awareness and understanding of self uh, and how important those components are for sex education. Um, and so uh, these are also very important aspects of our mental health and our overall, overall wellness. So I was wondering if you could speak to what are the challenges and barriers that uh, some young people navigate when they're unable to center, express their gender and sexual orientation um, or their identities in general in a way that understand, um, in a way that they understand it. Um, I'm especially interested in discussing how the pandemic has shifted these barriers uh, and or the perception of those barriers. So sure. another loaded question. We like loaded questions. <laughs> Yes, I'll take it. Um, I'll take it bit by bit, and I think I'll just start by talking about the barriers that a lot of AEPI people, young people, face. Um, you know, when trying to express their gender and their sexual orientation. Um, Ninety percent of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in the United States are either immigrants or children of immigrants. So that means 90% of them are likely straddling two different cultures in their household and growing up with different cultures, one of which is likely maybe even worse than the United States is on acceptance and inclusion of LGBTQ identity and sexuality. And when you're living with parents who do not accept that, I know many people here do understand that feeling, it's not pretty. And in a lot of Asian cultures, the whole idea of sexual health and sexuality, it's not a thing. It is the opposite of what you would call sex positive. Um, growing up, I didn't, I didn't even know what a gynecologist was until like college, maybe after college. And people were like, you should go to the gyno. And I was like, but I'm not having kids. I don't, that's not what I'm trying to, you know, I had no idea that that was a regular non-shameful thing that people go to as a part of their as a part of their health um, and sexuality is, a, is an incredibly taboo topic um, you know it's incredibly binary you are or you aren't and um, you know I think things I think things can be changing but also um, you know when we're talking about conversations with parents about sexuality um, imagine having to have a language barrier with your own parents and those talks tough conversations get even tougher. Like, I don't know how to say sexuality or homophobia um, in Mandarin, and that's the language that I grew up with, and that's the language that I speak with my mother. And so you have to think about how all of these barriers factor into, um, you know, leading into a lot of repression and shame and uh, how difficult it can be growing up in those environments. 
The other thing is that mental health, in addition to sexual, sexual health and sexuality not being a thing, mental health is also not a thing in a lot of Asian cultures. It's not an accepted concept. Um, you know, a lot of our, I mentioned um, our immigrant heavy background and how a lot of immigrants are just like, oh, you know, what do you mean you're depressed? Like, just work harder. It's the, it's the immigrant mindset of, you know, just work harder and we find this is, this is a, a survival tactic. You just have to get through it. And if you don't, you know, then, then you're weak. And um, that's kind of, an, again, another very binary concept of mental health that many API young people grow up with. And as a result, Asians don't seek resources for this, much less Asian young people. Um, Asians are the least likely of any racial group to seek mental health resources. And, um, you know, as, as an adult, I mean, this is what happens when you grow up in an environment as a young person, um, having to repress a lot of these, um, a lot of these emotions. And um, as an adult, 43.9% of Asian American adults who experience major depressive episodes receive treatment compared to 68.5% of white adults. Um, and so you can see how that factors into um, your mental health later on in life. Um, and so, you know, I can go on and on about my personal experiences and what it's like for, for many other API young people. But um, the answer to your question is what happens when you have all these barriers. It's, it's not pretty. Um, and it definitely has an effect on your mental health as an adult and having to deal with a lot of cultural barriers later on as well. And, oh, I didn't answer your question about the pandemic. Um, yeah, you, you too. I'm here I mean, taking every... this in, so just add. <laughs> you took me to a place. Every, everything is exacerbated with a pandemic, right? I think we're seeing that in so many other places. And everything I just said is just exacerbated even more. You know, you're living with parents who might be un unaccepting of, of yourself and your identity, the core of who you are, and you're not able to go to school and be with friends who might actually understand you. Um, you know, in a lot of Asian cultures, and I don't want to stereotype because this isn't this isn't the experience of many people growing up in API families, but um, the idea that the youth really need to step up and help provide for their families in times of crisis is, is very strong. And so for a lot of families who are going through tough times right now, that's an additional pressure on API young people in their households. Um, and then, you know, I'd be remiss not to mention the harassment and violence against um, APIs that's that's seen a spike in the last year, 68% um, of which uh, were reported by women and women are you know, two times more likely to report that. And we don't have that, this, that data disaggregated by sexual orientation and gender identity, but I think we know what it would look like if we did. And um, you know that combined harassment um, that we see on so many intersectional fronts. So that's what I'll say about that. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Jacqueline. Um, especially that, just that reminder of what um, uh, language uh, and the, the impact that language has and um, uh, family culture and um, your environmental culture and just, you know, all the different uh, things that play into that experience. Um, and so I appreciate you sharing those personal experiences and and um, other sort of other vulnerable pieces. So thank you. Um, is there anything that folks want to add to that one? Um, sure, I'll I'll chime in. Um, but I really appreciate what you said, Jacqueline. Yeah. So, um, you know, the thing of the thing about it, right, is that like what we what young people need is. Um, information that is culturally responsive. Um, at Glisten, we use inclusive curriculum as the shorthand, right? And like, so why is inclusive curriculum important? Uh, why do you need it, right? Inclusive curriculum or seeing yourself kind of in education, um, not seeing, let me start the other way around, not seeing yourself in education, right? It creates adverse mental health effects. Not learning about people like you leads youth to not understand themselves and their experiences 
you know, understand they're wider that, hey, it's not just me that's feeling this. It's not just, you know, and like fill in the blank. It's not just my body that does this. It's not just um, me and my brain, right, that feels this way, right? It's, this is, there are shared experiences and I come from a larger community of people. Um, and when that happens or frankly doesn't happen, it leads you to not understanding themselves and their experiences. This leads you to feeling confused and alone and not feeling good about yourself, right? Leads to risky behavior. Um, and risk-taking, not keeping yourself safe, not understanding how to keep yourself safe, and not feeling like you are worth keeping safe, right? I really appreciate your point, Jacqueline, about language. Um, and while this is not the like, this is not about like, what is the word in this other language for this, but thinking about what education does is creating language for young people to understand the world. When we don't give them that language, right? When we don't help pass on that information, how are folks really supposed to, to name it, name what they are experiencing and understand it? Um, and so, you know, hey, there are wonderful things that happen when, when you uh, when you see yourself in um, in the curriculum. You get to learn about yourself. You get to see that you aren't alone. You get to see what people have done before, what they have tried, what has failed, what has worked. You get to see that you're part of a legacy. You're part of a community, um, and you get to understand yourself in a broader context. So, um, all this to say that, like, the point of how we help young people understand themselves is by helping them understand themselves. <laughs> like, you know, it's like the thing I hated hearing when I was a young person is like, ain't nothing new under the sun. It's like, okay, that is like low key true. Um, don't tell 10 year old Melanie that and don't tell 17 year old Melanie that. But the, but the, the tea is that, okay, like we get to be different adults. We get to be different facilitators of and guides and path clearers for these young people. Let us do it, and let's not lie to them. Like, let's let's actually set them up for success. I keep I keep going back to what do we owe these kids, um, and we owe them everything. And the least that we can do is give them the truth, um, and that's what we should be doing. I I really love that, Melanie uh, Andrew. If I if I can jump in for for five seconds, which is to build off the we owe them truth, and yet what is what is happening when these barriers ex come into play? Is that we tell them that, that they're when they don't see themselves, right? They feel that loneliness and they trust senses and systems that tell them that they don't actually exist, right? So um, I'm a bi I, I identify as a bisexual, right? From within my own community, I am constantly told that I'm not actually who I say I am, right? The if you're a young person you're hearing that your parents are asking you if it's a phase if this is a the barrier is is the erasure the the like uh no not really right um i love i love jacqueline you mentioning um not knowing the words for some of these things because again that's that's this exact point like they we don't talk about it because it doesn't exist um and that conversion therapy as we all know is is devastatingly bad for young people um and the opposite of it, the affirmative healthcare, the affirmative therapy, right, is inaccessible. We, I mean, we know this, like 54% of the LGBTQ youth who wanted mental health care this year could not access it. That more than half. Like if 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 only Timmy uh gets health care, but Tommy doesn't, right? Like that is that is setting Tommy up for the, the opportunity of conversion therapy being the only access point of, of a erasure type of framework being the only access point to um, uh, to any objective uh, spaces. And it's not objective, it's, it's not truth. So I didn't want to pull us too away, far away from it, but I think one of the barriers of that silence to build off of the greatness of what Jacqueline and, and Melanie is saying is that the, the opposite of it is also inaccessible. So there's barriers of getting the truth. And then there is, you know, supersize me availability of the lies. Yeah, and I and I I appreciate the notion also around like, you know, I often say I can't be me if I don't see me. Um, so if you don't see that even the possibility of yourself, see folks that uh, share similar experiences, identities, looks, um, it's a lot harder to to imagine what it could be like. Um, before we shift from this question, I do want to also um, mention that you know, sitting in the pandemic, um, for some young people, being at home and not in the school environment has been so much better, right? Um, especially for some like neurodivergent young people um, and just uh, maybe folks that uh, they just don't learn in that kind of environment. And so um, 
as we're thinking that uh, shifting back to the schools is going to improve some young people's mental health, um, it's really going to maybe impact or uh, create challenges for others who were thriving um, during uh, school at home or school away from, you know, the standard school environment. So I also want us to make sure um, to think about, you know, those young people as well. Um, okay, so we are going to jump into the next question. Keep moving. I am watching the Q&As that are coming in, so please feel free to keep uh, throwing those our way. Um, so at CECAS, we shared the belief of providing young people with medically accurate and age-appropriate information about their reproductive and sexual health. As we challenged ourselves to push even further and beyond that, what is the impact that culturally responsive sex education, affirming school and home environments, and overall affirming people have on a young person's mental wellness? Another loaded question. Oops, sorry, Melanie, start us off. I can jump in. So, you know, um, here's the thing, is that intersectionality is important, right? So our young people are just like the rest of us. They are in whole entire beings, right? That have many, many parts of themselves. And so um, if you are teaching me something, uh, Melanie, something about Black history, that's lit. Um, also teach me something about what women have done. Teach me something about what queers have done. Teach me something about what non-binary people have done. Teach me all about all of me, right? Um, and so this is particularly important um, when we're talking about sex education. We're thinking about it's not only important to include LGBTQ plus young people in that story. It's important to talk about folks in the disability community. It's important to talk about folks in people of color and BIPOC communities. It's important to talk about folks who are gender diverse, right? The beauty, the beauty, the beauty beyond the binary of our um, of our bodies. That's a lot of bees. Uh, sorry for that alliteration, right? <laughs> but like we understand. Sorry, just to say the side point, right? We understand that in nature, binaries don't exist, right? And so, why would they exist in our own bodies? And so, why when we are pushing young people into systems that are meant to educate them, why not educate them about the reality of what is true um, and the complexity and the beauty in that complexity and diversity. Um, young people should be able to uh, understand, learn about and express their gender in a way that they can understand, right? Negative and horrible um, should not be the norm, right? When people think about their bodies, when they think about what their bodies do, um, when they understand what's happening um, around them. And then the other thing I'd, I'd be remiss to say, uh, remiss not to say, particularly when we're talking about schools, is that policing happens, right? This is like cultural policing, but also policing, policing happens in schools, right? And we know there's dif disproportionate and differential discipline um, and disproportionate um, and differential, um, uh, just negative impacts that happen on young people. So young people of color, um, like by themselves, like LGBTQ plus young people by themselves, people with disabilities by themselves, just as, a, as that identity, and young people experiencing homelessness by themselves, right? And so but we also know that young people are not just one thing, right? So when you are young and LGBTQ plus and BIPOC and a person with a disability and maybe experiencing some homelessness, right? You are in the crosshairs of and the, uh, the lack of safety in schools, right? So as we're talking about culturally responsive sex education and affirming school and home environments, we have to think about all of our young people and not only how we have to make sure that we are in our education, not policing people's understanding of themselves and their gender and sexual identity. We also have to act, we have to figure out how to not actually police these young people <laughs> as they are going about their lives um, and in a place that is supposed to be affirming and enabling their education. Um, I'll stop there. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> um, I, and I love this discussion that we're having here about how uh, sex education is also about, you know, learning our bodies, how to be able to talk about what's happening to our bodies, whether that's policing of our bodies, whether that's things that we're experiencing um, with our sexuality, things that we're experiencing with our gender. Like, I just, I'm just really appreciating um pulling in these different dynamics of really thinking about how all of that is encompassed in, in sex education. Um, 
with this question, I'm going to add in another element because once again, I love complex questions. Um, but thinking about this question and adding on one of the questions that we got from our attendees is um, if this is, you know, this is the focus, this is the direction we're wanting to go, how do we advocate for it? How do we advocate for it, especially in places where there's maybe policies or viewpoints that um, oh, things shifted. Uh, viewpoints and policies um, that are, you know, maybe only an abstinence only education or viewpoint. So what does it look like to also uh, advocate for this, you know, culturally responsive, um, you know, age appropriate, medically accurate uh, sex education as well? Jackie, do you want me to start? Um, I have a thought on it, but I also want to make sure to give you space if, um, I know we're playing like back, back and forth, um, but I, I'll i be very honest. Here's your like super honesty moment, Andrew. Like this, turn on the cameras, like ready to go for paparazzi. This is probably one of the very first times that Trevor Project is really in an event talking about sex education. We We, we don't do it. Uh, I, I'm doing it because I, I'm, I'm a big fan of y'all's. And at some point, um, they Trevor Project was silly and they hired an advocate who advocated um, that we start to work on some of these issues because I think the advocacy has to both be um, internal and external. That's the connection to this work. When you talk about um, beyond abstinence only, I think it's about, it's about um, knowing where people are right? I, I, I am not an expert um, in personally, right, in sex education, which means that I actively seek out education and opportunities to learn how to make um, this a conversation that is more accessible. I am, a, a, I, I am a, you know, raised Southern Baptist. I still preach in sermons in a church. And for me, Openly talking about my, that ex, those experiences, my faith, right, is gets me into hot water, right? It's this uncomfortable conversation with parts of my community. The same thing can be said for sex ed. So it's leaning into the uncomfortable and saying, we're not all going to have the same experience. On Sunday morning, I will be in a pew in a Baptist church. Someone else may be, um, you know, in a, in a mosque. Another person may be in a cathedral, and so, and many will be in no room other uh, other than maybe is football. No, football's probably not set Sunday morning, right? It's probably later. I don't know. At some point, some there's some insert sports analogy um, experience, right? But all of us are 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 believing and wanting to believe that we are bettering ourselves and bettering those around us, right? We're not. We're not trying to make the people around us um, uh, feel uncomfortable, but talking about that could be a little bit uncomfortable for some folks. So I think that is how you advocate in this space, right? Trevor Project is not, go we, we, we trust Seekus, right? Like we, we are, we're, we're Seekus fans, um, we're Seekus stands, I guess we'll call it, um, right? Uh, and in what we know though is that when a young person finds an affirming space, when they see themselves affirmed, right? That is a 35% reduction in the attempts of, of suicide. So, so what does non-abstinence only sex education look like? It literally means like saving someone's life because we were willing to have a, of a, a tougher conversation. It was saying, I recognize that these words have power. Um, that's, that's both the, the, the Trevor story and, and my, my story in this advocacy is the, is the, it's not always easy. We're, we're, we're a movement of complexity. We're a movement where we can't all be all things, but we can start, right? Trevor Project is having one panel with Seekus and trying to say, you know what? We stand with you. We want to grow. We want to learn. We want to do. Um, and that is what I think we'll, what, what we need more of in advocacy on sex education is we need people on the edges to say, I'll try it. I will, I will listen to your, to your arguments. I will stand with you and, and make the same arguments for affirmation. I will know, I will, I will build on what I know. Um, that's how I see us moving forward in this area. Yep. <laughs> that's what I gotta say to that. 
<laughs> Jacqueline. I had a I had a much more straightforward answer for advocating for inclusive sex I mean, mine was just in my head, the first thing that popped up was like just go, you know, go find your legislators and you know, hand the mic over to young people and let's hear about their experiences and why why abstinence only is is so so harmful and start organizing, start building coalitions with with groups on the ground, start talking to people, start going to places that people don't usually talk about these things. You know, it can't just be in the schools, it's gotta be um, in churches and family circles. Um, <laughs> sorry, cat. Um, and, you know, really have to, we really have to build a movement on this and we really have to keep the drum beat up. We really have to talk about uh, sex education as a crucial part of health and healthcare and, uh, reproductive health care and just education more broadly. Um, so I had a very simple answer to that question. Um, I also want to go back to something that Melanie mentioned earlier in this question, which was about intersectionality and having and teaching that in schools. And I think eventually we want to get to a point where that's not something that we have to teach. It's something that people know, right? Um, but I will point out that- um, Know and believe. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, I think, and I, you know, again, I'll just, I'll bring up, um, you know, the tragedy in Atlanta that happened last week. It wasn't just um, racial violence. It was also, um, you know, sexually motivated violence and misogyny. And, um, you know, we can't, you can't separate the two and we're failing our young people of color. And we've, if we're telling them, if we're setting them up to believe that the harassment and the violence that they experience is one or the other. Um, queer young people of color experience such higher rates of harassment due to both their race and ethnicity and their sexuality. For Asian Americans, um, that's 49% of queer young people experience that kind of harassment. And that's across, it's it's very much across the board for other people of color, 45% for black, 54% um, of Latinx queer young people and 65% of an indigenous LGBTQ youth. Those are terrible, terrible numbers. And so just the ability of, you know, if we can have sex education, um, you know, start teaching our people um, at a very young age about, you know, what is, what are, what is consent? What are healthy relationships? What is not being an asshole, honestly, and, you know, setting up a safe environment for schools, um, you know, that puts us in a much better place for young people to actually feel confidence and assurance in reporting harassment and assault and not gaslighting themselves, not feeling gaslit by adults who don't believe that these things happen so that when we get to adults and then, you know, people are gaslighting us again, that, you know, things like, you know, attacks on our community don't happen because of race or, or sexual violence, um, you know, that we, we believe in ourselves and, and that, you know, that's, that is a true experience of, um, of people in our community. Mm, snaps, snaps across the board. My goodness, uh, Melanie, did you were you gonna throw something out? Yeah, and I'll be, yeah. I'll be quick. Um, no, you could. And I would, I would just say that um, you know our power is collective, right? Like, how do we change things? Like, we make them change things. Part of my big Aries energy, the sun is in my sign, and so I'm like, uh, actually, everything is possible. <laughs> but um, in all honesty and seriously, right? We they win when we believe that we're alone. They win when they believe when we believe that we can't actually change things. They we they win when we think that there's nothing that we can do, right? And they win because we believe the lies, right? That they tell us. Um, actually, what is possible um, is that when we get together and we decide what needs to happen, we can actually make it happen, right? And so. Um, I'll just stay like broad um, at that level, but to sit, you know, to, like, how do we change things? We advocate, we make the people who we have elected to do a job, do their job. <laughs> and then we go tell the people that weren't elected that were maybe chosen or appointed, hey, you need to do your job. Here's what the law says, right? There's amazing work that Trevor's doing. There's amazing work that, um, that other organizations are doing to shift policy, right? To make sure that people have to do, you know, to say, here are the rules of the road. 
Um, and so part of what we what we are able to do at the policy level, right, is to is to set those rules and expectations. And then part of what we're able to do at the community level, at the mobilization level, at the activation level, is to say, no, hey, here are the here are the rules that we help to set. You have you now have to do them. So again, they win when we believe that we don't have the power to make them do what we want. Um, and you know, in the spirit of all the areas around and whoever it were, <laughs> they have to do what we want what we want them to do. They have to do what we tell them to do. Um, because we've organized um, and we've uh, put the rules in place. I'm such a firm believer in community and um, people. Um, we as people cause a lot of harm, but we also do a lot of good. Um, and I think that if we believe in, in people and we believe in community, it can really um, work itself out. So I, I appreciate that, that the collective, that the power is in the collective. It's so true. Um, so we've been throwing out a lot of amazing like facts and data and things like that. I know that Trevor Project and Glisten both have access to all sorts of reports and data and research and all the things online. Um, Jacqueline, does Napoff have that easily accessible on the website too with some of the research that you've been throwing out? Or what I actually is the just found the way? links. I'm gonna um, drop it in the chat. <laughs> so you all are gonna get all of those amazing facts um, dropped into the chat as well. So hopefully we can still access that. Um, I feel like somebody threw a question in the regular chat, um, Gabby. If that's the case, uh, oh wait, what are unique challenges, advantages, and possibilities do you see in sex education online? and more tech involvement having for youth. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on that one? Oh, see, now all the questions are coming in. <laughs> um, just the impact of se uh, sex education online, uh, more tech involvement for youth. I mean, what I would say is that, you know, technology is a tool um, and tools can be helpful or harmful um, tools. You might know how to use some tools. You might not know how to use some tools. You might have access to some tools and you might not have access to others, right? What we've seen um, in this last year with coronavirus and how it sent us all into our homes is that if your home is okay, then you'll be okay, right? Mm -hmm. If your home is not okay, you won't be okay. If your home does not have access to tech, you know, to, to reliable internet, you might see my internet glitching right now. <laughs> um, or if your home is, if your home is not a safe place where you are affirmed or seen um, or um, or made more whole, right? Then home is then home worsens things versus making them better. So so there are lots of possibilities um, that are that are opened up when young people are able to access um, sex education online, but that depends on their ability to access it, them knowing about it, and them having um, the resources around them to help them make sense of what they're seeing, right? What we need is a, um, is a quality of opportunity and of access, which is what we don't have, right? So yeah. yes, more, more of the good things, uh, but, we, but let us not think that just because there is online access that everyone will actually be able to see it, make sense of it, Etc. Right, and if you're able to do it at home, great. If your home is safe, but actually maybe not if your home is not a is not a good place. And I also think um, as educators, we have to be willing to learn too. So we know that that we've been thrown this um, this new world where a lot of things are having to be navigated online, and it's 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 uncomfortable for us. And um, we can't be afraid to also turn some of these questions back to young people. It's like, how would you like to learn? about sex education online? Like, what would that look like, right? Even that question in itself, um, engaging young people in that, hearing their ideas, um, also creates a conversation and opportunity to openly talk about sex education. Um, so I would also turn that question to young people. Um, so we aren't gonna get to all of these questions because they just came in three minutes for the end, um, I think, right? Because what time are we done? Are we done at seven or eight? You're I don't even know. I need help, Gabby. <laughs> I don't know what time we're supposed to be done. <laughs> I have one last question too. <laughs> um, but why I wait for Gabby for a second, um, if we could uh, quickly, uh, real quick speak to how can we encourage mental health advocates to move beyond thinking only of clinical services or, on, or hotlines and support other approaches like sex education as a way to improve mental health or wellness? 
Well, Sam, I'll take that. Uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll take the one that says we don't need a, a lifeline, which is a little antithetical to my work. So I'll uh, I'll I'll respond to it. Um, no, I think the question is coming from a really great place, which is, it is it is not enough. It is not enough to be an intervener. We need to be a preventer. Um, I, I need to be very clear. Um, I think that one of the ways that we have uh, inclusive sex ed also needs to be about having inclusive mental health policies. Little known fact, one in three schools across America have no mention of the word suicide in any of their policies. Teachers are Googling the word suicide when a student starts to talk about it because they don't know what to do, right? This is something that should be a failing grade it is a failing grade um, for our, 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 our country. And yet most people aren't talking about it. So those policies include three major parts. So to answer your question of like going beyond the crisis line, yes, prevention is critical, right? Knowing what, um, I like to call this prevention, prevention is knowing what a symptom looks like, right? If I'm sneezing, right, is that allergies? or COVID, right? Like I need to know these things and a war and, and, and prevention is, is recognizing differentials and recognizing uh, needs. Then there's intervention. Let's be clear. There's going to be young people who do not see them, who will, we have had many, many, many a call or chat to our lifeline of sex ed happened today and nothing, nothing. I felt that people laughed made jokes about about identities that I'm holding, right? Like, what am I supposed to do about that, right? Like, so we understand that in those moments when crisis happens, we need an intervention system. That's your doctor visit, right? So are you sneezing? What is it? Prevention. You need to go to the doctor. The doctor needs to be there. But then you also need to know about that doctor's note after you went to school, the return, the postvention, the what is it like in the, the, the weeks and months after sex ed has happened when let's be very clear, conversations around us campus are, are anything but positive, right? They're disaffirming continuously now. Um, you don't see a support system because your health education teacher maybe just said that, you know, your identity doesn't exist. Um, that's going to lead to a postvention problem. This we this this idea of response, right? Like, what is that doctor's note that actually says, "Hey, I needed help. I got it, and here's how you can support me to continue to be successful." That that, that is a continuum. It's a spectrum. So, I think if I remember your question correctly, Andrew, it's not necessarily that we don't need crisis lines. It's that we, as mental health organizations, as a, as a mental health organization, I fight for the continuum. I fight for you to never be in crisis in the first place. And I fight for you that if you are in crisis, making sure that we can, you can get support. And then I also fight that after the crisis is done, your support doesn't end. That is, that is how we need to be talking about sex ed, mental health, uh, anything that is awesome for our young ones. 100%, um, yes. Also, sorry for my little panic, we have a little under 30 minutes still we're doing all right everything's great um you know and i i think information is powerful you you kind of also went into you know the second question another question around like prevention education so like i'll let people build on that if they want but um you know i i think uh knowledge is power um, and and you talking about how can we understand our experiences, being able to talk about our experiences as a way to um, maybe not need some of, of these uh, mental health uh, supports like hotlines or clinical services, right? Like if, if these conversations can just be a norm, if we can be able to express ourselves and, and talk about our experiences openly in all environments, then we may not need a lot of private environments to be able to navigate those conversations. So I, I think that's what I really pulled from what you're saying is like, what does it look like for us to, to normalize these experiences um, and be able to talk about them openly, um, whether that's an experience as a person of color, LGBTQ folks, living with disability, um, and or just about not being okay, right? Experiencing depression, all those things. Um, then, then we, 
will need less of some of these other services. Because once again, back to Melanie, um, you know, uh, we hold the power, right? It's in the collective, it's in, in people, and we can take care and support our people if, if we're allowing those conversations to happen. So yes, to that, I'm here for it. Um, anything that folks wanted to add to that conversation or even pulling in, talking about prevention education, um, you know, and, and the role that that plays in, in undoing or, or uh, addressing stigmas and negative beliefs. People have any, I think you also kind of hit on some of that, Sam, in your response. So it was like a two for one. <laughs> I'm happy to do it. I, I'm all for it. I, I appreciate that. I want to be, I want to be clear about one part, which is as well, which is um, prevent. I, I love that you said it's about a communal, communal experience, right? Like, let's be clear. The reason that I, I'm, I'm connecting these worlds of mental health and sex ed, sorry for talking again, sorry, but this is in my, it's on my mind, it's on my heart. The reason I can connect it is that I'm comfortable talking about death. I do it on a day-to-day -day basis and I, I try to prevent it, right? But like, but I, I'm ready to talk about it. And Seekus is ready to talk about sex. But the problem is, is that we have communities that we are not preventative yet because we can't, we can't bring ourselves to have the conversation in the first place. So that silencing leads to crisis lines. I would love to be out of a job. I am so ready for the day. Trevor Project uh, is no longer needed. Like, do not need that job security. I will go make my coin somewhere else, right? But until that day, we have to be starting the conversation with prevention. It's, I, I, I just didn't want to make it sound like I, I believe that intervention is, is not necessary. It is super necessary right now because right we don't have the prevention systems in place that actually equalize and talk about the uncomfortable. Sorry. And let me just add, because I think that's a great point. Um, when we do that education and intervention, it has to be culturally responsive, right? Like it actually can't be, you know, I don't know, uh, Barbecue Becky wouldn't recognize the symptoms right, of a young, of a young BIPOC uh, person who was in crisis because their, their view is shaped by white supremacy, right? You would not be able to see and intervene effectively or educate effectively a person with a disability if your lens is clouded by ableism, right? Or, and, and pick any other identity, right? So there's a way in which, yes, all of what Sam said, and on top of that, it's around, we have to take seriously um, being able to see our young people for all of who they are, right? Schools are not just buildings, right? Schools are communities, right? Children are not our whole people, not just students uh, and not just students between whatever, 8 a.m. and 4 p.m., right? We have to educate and support and see these young people in their entirety, in their wholeness, if we're gonna be effective at educating them about anything intervening when they are in crisis and taking seriously their um, experiences. I co-sign everything Melanie just said, and um, you know, thank you so much for bringing up cultural competency. You know, two three times now, it's something that we at NAP Health always talk about when we're talking about culturally competent healthcare and culturally competent sex sex education. And it's it's often tough for me to actually define what that is and what that looks like because I've never seen it. Um, at least not. For me growing up in a public school in Texas, I didn't, I don't know what culturally competent care looks like. Um, so thank you for naming that. Yes. And I will say the person that had asked the prevention question um, just added on a little more about like folks that are receiving, you know, absence only education. Um, you know, how do what is the recommendations for undoing that learning? Um, and and what I will say is. Um, back to that conversation of like power and information, right? So once again, going back to everybody navigates the experience of sexuality, every single person, right? Um, so whether it's their experiences, no, I'm not, I, I don't really want to talk about sexuality. They at least know that they don't want to talk about it. Um, there are people that are trying to navigate it themselves. There are people that feel like they have a, a firm understanding. Um, and for me, my approach is always to give information and allow people to do with that information how they feel like they can, right? Um, 
you know, there is undoing or there's just um, adding to it, right? Because abstinence is only is always an option, right? Like abstinence is a form of comprehensive sex education, 100%, right? Um, and what we know is that there are other things as well. And so um, I, rather than an undoing, I very much see it as an adding to it, providing more information um, and opportunities to uh, reflect internally and personally about how maybe I've navigated in my life at different points, right? So asking questions about like, when did you first know your gender? When did you first know your sexual orientation? Um, having people explore that and figuring out how they even got to that point is always helpful when trying to bring new information to people. I don't know if there's other people that wanna to add to that question, but I just thought I would add that piece. We also have a lot of great experts, I'm sure, on this call. Um, so, I mean, the chat feature is still there too, if other folks feel like they wanna add to that question. Um, next question. Y'all, we're really talking about some things tonight. Like for real, for real. <laughs> um, everybody, like, <laughs> I'm I'm so funny. I just I always wanted like stars, like you know those star stickers that like teacher. I used to work in childcare, so I feel like I'm just like kicking with four of you right now, and that there are 107 people watching us. But um, those little star stickers, and it's like, oh, everybody's doing a good job. Like I want to give you a star sticker, so I might just send y'all like star stickers. Do you, know, do you know how much I want one? Like, <laughs> like, like well, Sam, I got you. Welcome, I got you. Uh, Welcome to the glittery lipped queer here. I'm like, I need the stickers. I need I the stickers. So <laughs> I got you. And in the chat, Amy's with us in the star sticker. So um, anyway, so back to this lovely panel. Um, what are your most excited or hopeful? Oh, hold on. What are you most excited or hopeful about when it comes to our young people? What assets or strengths do you think young people bring and how can we as adults use those assets to promote optimal health for all youth? Wow, that was like a beautiful question. I just wanna put out there. So yeah, what are y'all's thoughts? Talk about how amazing our young people are. What are you excited about? I am always impressed by young people when we bring them into advocacy spaces. Um, I mean, just the, the way that they're able to talk about things um, and be so true to themselves and just are so well versed in, you know, politics and advocacy already. Um, Whenever I listen to young people speak, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna shut up because I'm like, a, I feel like a conservative in this space. You know, young people are so ahead of the game. Um, and I think that's why we really need to, to hand them the mic and just let them do their thing. And I think, um, I think adults have a lot to learn from young people in the way that they're so um, unapologetic and bold and outspoken. And I think that, um, you know, I think a lot of my generation, older generation has a lot to learn from that. And, um, you know, sometimes wanting to just be, um, you know, doing what's easy or doing what's, what we think is possible. And um, I really, you know, we really just need to be turning to young people to do a lot of this work and supporting them in doing that work. Um, so I would say young, young people are lit. Uh, like, what are the ways in which young people aren't lit? I dare you to like to give a good reason, a good, one good thing that's not super lit about young people. Um, I actually can't think of any. Um, here's what I would say uh, to this question, which is that, you know, I think like the job of, of um, adults and like older folks and elders, right, is to help inform. Like, what can I do to help you be smarter than me to get farther than I've gotten and to think about the world even more expansively than I've been able to imagine in my wildest dreams, right? And so um, maybe I'm not exactly answering the question, but to me, to me, it's the question, um, the, at the heart of the question is young people are lit and whole and perfect in themselves, right? And so part of our work has to be about getting older folks and elders 
um, in a helpful position and then out of the way, right? <laughs> like, how can I be like, let me, and I'm not quite auntie age, I'm like at the, at the verge of auntie age, but like, let me bring my little chair and my little sippy cup <laughs> and I will sit here and cheer you on doll, right? <laughs> it's like, you go on and let me, and let me rest my knees, right? Because, because I've been here and popping and locking it for a long time <laughs> and I don't want to drop it anymore. Like it's, I, I want to sit down. Um, so uh, the point here is that young people are whole and perfect. Um, there is nothing that we need to do as adults to fix them. What we need to do is give them the information um, and maybe let them know what we've known, right? If we're drawing a map, it's like, here's the quicksand and here are the alligators, go be great. You know what I mean? What do you need? You need a snack on your way? Um, let me help you out, right? So um, that might not be as comprehensive of an answer because I think the, 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 the answer, the list is just too long. Um, there are all of the things that are perfect about young people. And it really is about how do we as elders, increasingly elders, right, in this, um, in this movement, open doors, um, you know, kick, kick open doors if we have to, bust down walls, um, and, then, and, then, and then get out of the way. How do you follow? How do you follow a what, Sam? They're perfect. Like figure out something. Like, like I mean, that's, Good luck. That's, a, that's, a, that's a great. That's what I got. <laughs> right? Like, I, I will controversially Ditto. say, um, and Melanie and I are going to be besties. So I will, I'm going to be besties with all of you because again, we're just we're just chatting, and there's a hundred people watching us. But like, I don't necessarily agree that they're perfect. I will, I will, I will argue that um, because of the thing I'm about to say. Their greatest asset is their super metabolism for growth. Like the, the, I am a huge TikTok person, not actually popular, but like love, love TikTok, right? And it is this short, succinct moment of learn, go, learn, like experience. Like, like it's, it's, a, it's a dance that took them eight hours to learn for 15 seconds of perfection, right? But that growth immediately just evolves into the next space. That is their greatest asset and the thing we need to, to, to support, right? I love the idea of, of, um, of if, if I can keep your attentions on something, um, I will, you will solve this problem far greater than any adult will ever imagine it, right? Because you're, you're thinking in, in, in 10x speed. Um, I believe that that makes that that comes with hurdles the hurdle being if um i personally listen to all my podcasts at like 2x right well that's great i get through my podcast i like understand my stuff but i'm also probably not quite like calming down i'm probably basically like a little bit little bit pushing myself and my body um more than i need to right and for young people i think that could be a moment of of, of potential and potential slight imperfection, which is the speed leads to sometimes moments of, um, I was told by Auntie Melanie where the quicksand was, but I believed I could run so fast that it wouldn't actually pull me down. Um, I believe what we need to be doing is to say, okay, I sense that you're gonna just, um, you know, flash past this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna build some, uh, you know, some planks down here on the quicksand. Thank you for uh, elders for telling us where they are. And now you can run across this, the quicksand um, at the speed you want to go. That is where I think the, uh, I don't know if any of that metaphor actually worked now that I think about it. And I don't know if I remotely answered your question, but their greatest TDLR, their greatest asset is their speed and their potentiality for evolving and growth. They, they move and grow and learn faster than anything I can ever imagine, than any computer could ever keep up with. And their, their challenge and subsequent work and that is a, what do we do to make sure that the world is ready for their speed? Mm -hmm. Let me jump in because um, I'm going to add to what Sam said, um, and I would say that let me let me couch what I'm about to say by saying young people are magic, but they're not magical, right? Um, and I think that what ha what happens is that yes, the like able to metabolize and take in information, etc. And like here's the Achilles heel, right? Folks will believe as young people, you will believe what you are being told by people who are who have been around, who have seen more, who might be older, who who love you, right? Who say they love you, right? You will believe, folks will believe what they hear. And so that also makes you more vulnerable, right? And so the thing is that the beauty of young people is that you are deeply resilient, 
Um, and I think that the challenge, and here's what's not fair. And I say this is a, from a place of experience. What is not fair is when you are asked to be resilient, when you actually shouldn't have to experience the pain or discomfort or injustice in the first place, right? There's a such, there's such thing as being overly resilient. And I think what we, what we require of our young people is to be overly resilient and that's not fair, right? And so um, Sam, I love that you picked up my, sand, my quicksand metaphor because as a person who grew up on cartoons, I'm, I have questions about, can you actually put planks over a quicksand? Cause how big is the quicksand? But the whole point is that again, like magic, but not magical um, and, and, um, and resilient, but not invulnerable. Right. So what is the what are the ways that we can that we as adults, as educators, as organizational leaders, as you know, as movement leaders can help to build containers where young people can come and try things and have safe to fail moments. Right. Like where you can mess up. This is what this is. This is what was true for me. I was able to mess up and have somebody maybe grab me by the scruff of my neck and pull me out the quicksand and like, don't do this again. Right. <laughs> and go over there. But the point is that it. What, what, no, what none of us deserve is to have any one thing that we do define us forever, right? Any one thing that we experience define us forever. And so I wish that we didn't ask young people to be so resilient. I wish we didn't ask them to spend their magic on survival, right? Um, and um, I think that there is uh, such a gift, right? Young people are such a gift. Mm. Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's what I say when I just, I don't, I have too much to actually say. I just say yes, yes to all of that. Um, so we have done it. Um, we really only have one question left. There's one question in the Q&A and that one is gonna be answered in chat. Um, so we'll get an answer to that one shortly. Um, but, I have one last question for you all. Um, and it's really just continuing this conversation about young people. Um, so my last question is, what message would you like to share with any young um, LGBTQ2S plus person or a young BIPOC person or young person living with a disability? Um, and, uh, you know, young folks that may be watching this today, um, what would you like to share with them? Um, you know, knowing that they may be seeing themselves reflected in a conversation or in one of our identities for the first time. Whoever would love to start. I'll go before Melanie. <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> I don't know. You've had some moments, Jacqueline, tonight. So I, I don't know if any of y'all are safe, but yeah, go ahead. Um, I I would like to say to all the young um, Asian American or Pacific Islander people out there who are watching, um, especially as you've had to experience the last week, um, what I can imagine is similar to the way that I have. Um, is to not like everything that you experience is real and is yours and everything that is harmful to you and that um, is unjust that's happened to you. Um, it's not just all in your head. It is just, you know, don't, don't gaslight yourself. Don't let other people gaslight you. Your experiences are real. Um, you know, you have the right to, to be happy and to be free and to be who you are and not let anybody take that away from you. Um, I grew up, you know, always being made fun of for being Asian or receiving lots of racialized sexual harassment. And for a long time, I was like, this is just the way the world is, you know, and this is just how I'm supposed to live my life um, in this world. That's just how the world is going to treat me. And that never had to be the case. Um, you know, I had a lot of unlearning to do about how wrong that was and how, you know, I had other support systems and people um, who would have helped me not think that way. And, um, you know, just a lot of gaslighting myself and being like, oh, is this real? And a lot of people, 
you know, a lot of microaggressions or people being like, oh no, that wasn't racist or like, oh no, that wasn't because you're a woman. Um, you know, whatever you experience is real and um, let yourself feel that and let yourself speak out about that and also find other people who look like you. I was very lucky that I had a strong Asian American community um, growing up and, you know, kids in my classroom who look like me and we really stuck together. And that's really what got me through school. You know, that's really what got me through um, 12 years in a, in a very waspy public education system. Um, so find those who are like you. Um, also like all of my other classmates of color too, you know, we, were, we, we stuck together and, um, you know, you, we, we say that now in a lot of advocacy spaces and activist spaces, but um, start young, you know, find the people who are like you and, um, you know, validate your own experiences. I feel like it's double Dutch. You want to go, Sam? Or you want me to go? I'll let you go. I'll I'll take the I'll take the absolute risk, which is trying to follow you. So this is probably the stupid decision I made it today. But double Dutch, double Dutch. Yeah, having right. to follow. I feel like having to follow both of them. Like that's a good look, everybody. All right. Um. So here's uh, here's what I would say, um, to young people. Um, you're not crazy. If like things feel wrong and off, it's it is that, and it's not you. Um you know, the adults in your life and the systems that you are made to go through to endure um, owe you uh, better. Uh, you deserve better than what you're getting. And there are people who don't know you um, specifically, but know you generally and who love you and are out here working, like working to make this world better for you. And to the extent that you see those people doing that work, let them know you see them and give them pointers and feedback of like what they ought to be doing to do it better. Um, at Glisten, um, and, I, and I know at Napoff, I know at Trevor and many other places, we are here for you and we applaud um, you and what you are doing. There are lots of ways in which the, the reason I go to work every day is because I'm listening for what the next thing is that you all um, at the grassroots, in the schools, in your communities, in your homes are doing, the ways that y'all are queering up space, the ways in which you are demanding more and better. Um, and so there are folks who are doing all this work, um, who are listening um, to you all, because you are the engines of change, um, and we're here for that. Um, and then, you know, Auntie Mel wants to give you a little bit of advice, um, which is to trust your gut, right? If something feels off, it is off. If something feels good, it might be good. Um, and so trust your gut, find your light, um, and find people who reflect your light back to you, um, and feed that. Um, and, you know, I have a friend who's, I have a number of friends who are artists and they have a, um, a collective called the Trust Your Struggle Collective. Um, and there's something I just love about that name, which is like, trust your struggle, trust your journey, ask for help when you need it um, and, you know, find your light. Beautiful friend, beautiful, beautiful friend. Um, I, I showed up to, to, the, to the little ones uh, watching and to the little ones who will watch. I, I showed up to Washington DC with a bright red mohawk and a bunch of stilettos here, one second. These, these were the first heels I wore into Congress. There weren't people who looked like me wearing heels in Congress. There were people in my movement who told me that I was being too much, that there wasn't a place for me in politics because politics was about professionalism. And that idea was that um, my trans identity and my ability to try to be myself had to come second to what um, the community or movement needed. And that was a lie. It didn't. I when as soon as this pandemic is over, we'll still be walking those marble halls in stilettos, knowing that I deserve to be there. And you do too. It's a very simple idea of um, worthiness. We talked about breaking the cycle and the greatest way that I broke a cycle of thinking that I was not worthy of a movement who was fighting for me was to recognize 
that the movement was fighting for all. We're in all inclusive sex ed, all inclusive stopping Asian hate, all inclusive um, education. These are, these are ideals, um, but they're also um, shared. And when I think about that, ex that inclusiveness, I have to remember that there is that place. Um, I, I hope this isn't too much, Andrew, so if it's too much uh, in the space, I, I, I sing a song um, that I sing with the, the Gay Men's Chorus. I get to sing in the Kennedy Center with, in the, with the Washington National Opera. I love music. It's a really beautiful space and, and a beautiful um, song that I cannot wait to sing to my child um, each morning and which I think, sorry, each night, and I think resonates in this space is, um, you can be anybody you want to be. You can love whomever you will. You can travel any country that your heart leads and know that I will love you still. You can be by yourself. You can gather friends around. You can choose one special one. And the only measure of your words and your deeds will be the love you leave behind when you're done. That is how I perceive what we need to be. We need to be so loving and so clear that it doesn't matter what shoes we wear, what words we say, what, you know, what bills we pass. It is about the love that we get to keep sharing. And that is something I think that um, every single one of you get to get to do. So to the little ones watching, go love some more. Go yes. keep loving and be loved in return. Mm, thank you. Um, thank you to each of you for bringing your authentic selves to this conversation today, both personally and professionally. Um, this was a beautiful conversation and I actually can't wait to watch it back and just sit in it. Um, you know, a thank you to everybody that joined us today. Um, we've had a large number of people in here all day, all night. Um, so, so thankful and appreciate, appreciative um, of that. Uh, all the SICA staff, um, thank you. Um, thank the panelists. Um, and, you know, also thank you to Gabby who has kept us on track and um, just made sure that we were organized and tech stuff was working out. So uh, thank you very much. Um, we plan to continue holding conversations with leading experts, thought leaders, and movement innovators uh, to truly explore what sex ed for social change can mean on core issues and conversations like this one. Um, and we hope that you will come back for the next one as we explore LGBT and trans inclusivity in sex education even more in June. Um, and thank you very much. We hope everybody has a lovely, uh, wonderful evening. And um, we did it. We're done, only two minutes over. We done good and answered all the questions. So thank you everybody, have a great night. Um, and that's a wrap. <laughs> that's a wrap. <laughs> Good night. Bye. Bye. I'm stop the recording.